and good afternoon, folks who are joining us um, virtually for today's ICAP Grand Rounds. Um, this is just to note that we will get started in just one moment. Um, but just a reminder that today's session is being recorded. Uh, we do ask participants who are logging in to type in your affiliations into the chat box as we like to get a sense of who's online with us. Um, and also I'd like to direct your attention to the Q&A um, function at the bottom of your screen. If you have any questions at any point during today's session, please feel free to type them into the Q&A box. We will answer your questions either directly or use some of those questions um, during our facilitated um, discussion during today's session. So without further ado, I'm gonna hand it over to Susan to kick us off. Wonderful, thank you so much, uh, Fatima. I appreciate it and greetings to everyone who has joined. I'm quickly seeing where everyone is from. We have people from UCSF, we have Wisconsin, we have Harvard AIDS Institute in Botswana, Kenya, um, SPOP, a Service Program for Older People. Thank you all for being here. It's very exciting to speak with you. Those of you who know me know that um, this is a subject near and dear to my heart, as I'm sure it is to you, um, giving up your precious time to be with us today. I'm just going to check if Dr. Frieden is here. Okay. So here is the agenda for today. Um, I'm going to just take a few minutes to set the stage, some opening remarks to allow us to understand in context what the big picture issue is. And then um, hopefully we'll have opening remarks um, from Tom Frieden. And then we will go into two distinct uh, presentations, which at, look at two components that are essential for safeguarding our health workers, including infection control and the ever talked about supply chain. And then we will have a, a, a panel back and forth um, with our presenters and an additional discussant, mm -hmm. reflections from the field, and then a summary and call to action. So let's begin. Next slide, please. And uh, also, if you would like, I see many people putting their ideas into the, uh, in their um, association, into the chat box. And please feel free as we move along to put your uh, questions or comments into the chat box as well. We have people monitoring that. And once we get into the panel discussion, we would love to have your thoughts as well. So let's begin. It's a pleasure to uh, start this webinar in partnership with Resolve to Save Lives. We are presenting this webinar, um, as I said, because this is a subject that has hit close to home too many times uh, through many uh, epidemics and outbreaks and most recently COVID-19. If you could hit the space bar, uh, Hugh, please go ahead. So to date, the total number of cases in the world are 241,000. Uh, the number of deaths globally are, uh, sorry, 241 million, 4 million deaths. And the next, next tab. And greater than 100,000 of these deaths have been amongst health workers. If you could just go back, thank you. So these numbers are very sobering, yet we must look further into the numbers to understand the full picture of this crisis. The Guardian newspaper and Kaiser Health News launched a project in March of 2020 to account for health worker deaths, specifically in the United States. The completed project was, the project was completed, excuse me, in April of this year, so just over a year of data was collected, speaking with colleagues, friends, and family members of those who have died, and looking at the data on those who have died. 
what they found was very interesting and sheds more light behind the numbers that are very striking. More than half of health workers who died were less than 60 years old. These losses will therefore affect our health workforce for years to come. A majority of health workers who died identified as people of color. So again, we know that the social determinants of health also affect our healthcare workers. This could be to underlying health status disparities, as well as the types of jobs and their ability to access PPE within a variety of health systems. Family members, friends, and colleagues of the health workers who died reported that many of the cases involved concerns over inadequate PPE. Roughly one in three of the healthcare workers who died were nurses, followed by support staff and physicians. And this mirrors what we see from the literature on Ebola as well. A large propensity of people who died are nurses, partly because of their frontline status but also because they make up a, a large percentage, if not the overwhelming majority of the health workforce. A, an, another interesting thing to look at in this regard is that a huge number of the deaths were early in the pandemic. So we know that the early times in the pandemic are the riskiest and something we should remember as we move through our discussions today. And the last um, finding was that most people that died did not work in hospitals. So we often talk about supply chains with a focus on hospitals, but the area where most people um, who were health workers who died were working in nursing and residential facilities. And I see some people commenting in the chat box that that is um, where they are working. Unfortunately, this information is not surprising. As I said, during the 2014 to 2016 West Africa Ebola outbreak, frontline health workers were hit very hard early in the pandemic. Over this hour, we will have a chance to look more deeply at the persistent system-wide issues which we must tackle to safeguard health workers. And uh, Hugh, is, is Tom here? Yes, I am. Can you hear me? Oh, wonderful. Great. Lovely to have you here. Welcome, Dr. Frieden. I'll just introduce you and then hand over um, to you. Dr. Frieden is the president and CEO of Resolve to Save Lives, an initiative of vital strategies. Dr. Frieden is a physician trained in internal medicine, infectious disease, public health, and epidemiology. He is former director of the US CDC, and former con commissioner of the New York City Health Department. Dr. Frieden is currently president and CEO of Resolve. And he has a, began his public health career in New York City, identifying then leading the effort that stopped the largest outbreak of multi-drug resistant tuberculosis to occur in the United States. He was then assigned to India on loan from the CDC where he scaled up effective TB diagnosis and treatment. And when he was asked to return to New York City by Mayor Bloomberg's health commissioner, he directed efforts to reduce smoking and other leading causes of the death that increased life expectancy by three years. As director of the US CDC, Dr. Frieden oversaw the work that helped to end the 2014 West Africa Ebola epidemic. He now leads Resolve that partners with countries to prevent 100 million deaths and to make the world safer from epidemics. During the COVID pandemic, Dr. Frieden has overseen an expansion of Resolve's activities, including policy and program innovations in the United States, counseling and support to multilateral institutions, and support, and support for rapid response, healthcare worker safety, and data-driven decision-making in more than 20 countries countries. Dr. Frieden is a Senior Fellow for Global Health at the Council on Foreign Relations. Welcome, Dr. Frieden, and we look forward to your opening remarks. You have the floor. Thank you very much. It's very nice to be with you all this morning. Um, I'm actually in transit, um, but um, let me just make clear that healthcare workers are a fragile resource, as you all know, and we need to keep them safe. 
we already have a substantial global shortage of healthcare workers. And as you've already heard, it is the nursing staff that uh, this epidemic, this pandemic has borne down on most heavily. It's been estimated that there's a need for an additional 18 million healthcare workers in the next decade. And although uh, there are all sorts of declarations about the year of healthcare workers, uh, celebrating them as heroes is meaningless if we continue to fail to protect them. The years of training and the years of experience are irreplaceable in many ways. We know that healthcare workers are at high risk of infection with COVID-19, with the virus that causes COVID-19, with Ebola, with tuberculosis, and with other conditions. The estimated more than 115,000 deaths by July uh, translate to 200 every day that the pandemic started. And even in the US, we're seeing huge numbers of healthcare workers infected and dying. Um, we know that not only does an ill healthcare worker represent a loss of a vital community resource, but also that healthcare workers can transmit to others in the hospital and to their homes. In the SARS-1 outbreak, many, many uh, cases, in fact, most of the cases in both Taiwan and Toronto were linked to hospital infection. And we have to be frank that we have failed healthcare workers. Um, even a year into the pandemic in the US, um, more than 80% of nurses were reusing personal protective equipment. Appropriate high quality PPE remains in short supply. It's not standardized, it's overpriced, it's poorly designed for use in many low and middle income countries. And I'll just as a footnote here say, <clears throat> I think there probably are some uh, useful technologies that can be developed with reusable, elastomeric, cleanable, uh, breathable, um, talkable uh, uh, respirators, N95 or above. Uh, and this can be done in a sensible way for low and middle income countries. We also know that really shockingly, uh, many, many healthcare workers lack access to uh, COVID-19 vaccines. Um, uh, it was estimated as recently in July, as July that only one in eight health and healthcare workers across the world had been vaccinated and nearly the vast majority of those in high income countries. And there's a lack of national infection prevention and control policies and programs. This is often seen as an emergency response activity, but it needs to be uh, year round. We've, um, along with many other groups, issued a call to action to make facilities for healthcare workers safer. Uh, infection prevention and control needs to be a core part of all activities and requires a combination of policy, finance, and donor support. We have to invest in training, tools, and supportive supervision for a safer healthcare workforce. Um, there's a recent economic analysis that PPE investment um, would uh, cost about $10 billion to adequately protect every healthcare worker in low and middle income countries and would save more than 2 million lives in those countries with a societal return on investment that's about 80 fold the actual investment given. We also need a much, much better and more transparent way to monitor healthcare worker infections and deaths. Uh, these need to be reported and published. And we need to increase the equity of vaccine distribution and to ramp up manufacturing, because right now we're arguing about how to slice a pie that's too small. We need to make a bigger pie. We need to increase manufacturing of highly effective vaccines by breaking the duopoly of Moderna and Pfizer and getting mRNA vaccines more widely produced. Improving the safety of healthcare workers is not something that is a maybe is something that is a must. We have to do it. We have to invest in our future, our healthcare workers, and those who are responsible for taking care of others. Let me just, since uh, let me just mention before ending that we're very encouraged by some of the initial discussions we've had on the incorporation of treatment for hypertension into the treatment of uh, programs for HIV. Hypertension kills more than 10 million people a year more than all infectious diseases combined. It's extremely common, 20 to 30% of all adults in uh, most countries where we're all working and it's uh, woefully undertreated. Uh, in HIV, you've, you've had the 90-90-90 goal 
in um, pandemic prevention, we proposed a 717 goal, seven days to find all outbreaks, uh, one day to report them, begin investigation, and begin control, and seven days to implement effective control measures. And for hypertension, we're uh, proposing an 80-80-80 uh, goal, 80% detection, 80% treatment, 80% control to at least below 140 over 90. So there's a lot that we can learn from each other, but let's go back to the fundamental point that we have a, a moral, ethical, practical, and uh, uh, self-interested responsibility to protect all healthcare workers anywhere in the world. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Frieden. And as you were speaking, it made me think about the uh, leadership and decisiveness that you had to take um, when you were working in New York and um, addressing uh, drug-resistant tuberculosis. I was working as a nurse in a very rural area of Zimbabwe and um, we had a burgeoning number of people with HIV. We had no gloves, no sharp boxes, nothing. And I remember that you um, had to take very decisive leadership in how to control um, the drug resistance and inability to keep people on tuberculosis treatment as a, as a very um, decisive, I guess I'll say it again, um, decision to control that epidemic. And could you just say a little bit more about that and how um, you were able to, to institute that? Sure, in New York City, um, I was initially working as an epidemic intelligence service officer and documented along with colleagues, um, the spread of multi-drug resistant tuberculosis in many hospitals throughout New York City. And uh, we recognized that there were a few things that were driving the, the large outbreak. This is the largest outbreak of multi-drug resistant tuberculosis ever to occur in the United States. And um, <clears throat> one of them was poor infection control. So most of the cases of multi-drug resistant tuberculosis were actually picked up in the hospital, largely but not exclusively by uh, people living with HIV. So improving infection control was essential to breaking the back of the epidemic. Um, in addition, patients were routinely lost to follow up. In one analysis, only 11% of patients were documented to have been effectively treated. 89% either were lost to follow up or died. And we instituted a system uh, that Dr. Carol Stieblo had established of cohort reviews reviewing the outcome of each and every patient every quarter, one by one, to make sure that patients were being effectively and adequately treated. We also provided extensive outreach to patients. We provided housing, social services, nutritional support, counseling, medical care. We had the basic concept that the patient is the VIP of the program, and we worked accordingly. Um, in extreme cases where <clears throat> there were a few patients who had, um, uh, I guess, <clears throat> both drug use and sometimes personality disorders who refused to take uh, treatment, we provided for mandatory uh, <clears throat> isolation in a hospital, not a jail, um, and provision of all social services until they were cured. That was a, a rare requirement, but it was also essential to make clear to the healthcare workers who had sometimes admitted patients dozens of times that uh, all of us took this seriously. But the essence of this was an accountable system that tracked and held itself accountable for every single patient detected and an, uh, <clears throat> an, an orientation that was putting patients at the center as the VIPs of the program. In addition, um, we had a lot of analysis um, using good data to continuously improve performance was an essential component of our program. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. And hearing about that when I was overseas, it was very heartening to know, as you said, um, developing an accountable system. And we've seen elsewhere, especially in South Africa, the emergence of extremely drug resistant TB and the challenges there. We had a conference, supported a conference at, at the IAS conference for HIV a few years ago. 
And one of the health workers came up to speak to the microphone and said that she was exposed to, exposed to uh, multi-drug resistant TB and had to have a lung resection, um, which just again highlighted uh, the enormity of uh, risk to health workers when we don't have an accountable system able to protect them. Thank you for your comments and we will move on now to our first speaker. I would like to introduce Dr. Landry Cabago. Dr. Cabago is a medical doctor, medical virologist, and infection prevention and control specialist. He is working for the World Health Organization APRO region, region leading the IPC unit. Dr. Cabago has supported member states during the Ebola responses in the DRC, Guinea, and Ivory Coast, Marburg responses in Guinea, and the COVID-19 response in Africa. And I was in South Sudan last week and heard about an, a case of Ebola in the DRC. He is supporting member states to establish or strengthen their IPC programs at national and healthcare facility levels by developing national and facility action plans, which uh, Dr. Frieden just mentioned as um, a need that um, is still there. So thank you. Dr. Uh, Landry for being here and oh, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Susan, for the introduction. Let me share my screen. Can you see my screen? Not yet. Not yet. Okay, um, I think you can see it. Uh -huh. And just put into presentation mode and we'll be good to go. Okay. Thank you so much. So um, today I'm going to uh, discuss with you a little bit about some uh, characteristic or features uh, of the implementation of IPC uh, measures in healthcare facilities and in uh, in the member states in the African region. First, I will provide some key elements of the support that WHO with uh, partners are uh, providing to member states to improve IPC practice at facility as community level. Also, uh, we will I will provide as well some key recommendation and strategic directions for prevention, early identification, management, and uh, monitoring of health worker infections, as well as of uh, health worker who are exposed to COVID-19 patients. And lastly, I will discuss with you a little bit about what are the main challenges that we are facing uh, when we are implementing all these uh, corrective measures. So first, the first thing, um, especially when the pandemic started, uh, we started to support member states in the process of having an IPC task force at national level, which has as um, the main role to develop IPC response uh, plan uh, against COVID-19 pandemic, but also to uh, we share with them some guidelines that they have to adapt approve and disseminate uh, at each level of the health system, as well as some other tools and training materials, tools like uh, tools for uh, triaging the, the patients at the healthcare facility level, tools for assessing best practice, uh, IPC best practice in healthcare facilities. And also their role will really to map the different healthcare facilities of the country and make sure that their activities are targeting the ones which are, like, let's say, priority according to uh, the epidemic uh, situation of the country. Because in some countries, they have really many health care facilities and uh, we recommend it to start the implementation of corrective measures in the ones which are at more uh, risk. Uh, 
Also, we are advising them on how to quantify the IPC equipment, including the PPEs, the alcohol-based um, and rub, and other IPC um, materials. We were able also uh, to train trainers in the different country with the support of, uh, of other organization like Africa CDC, I can uh, resolve to serve life. And the second main support that we, we provide to member states is to make sure that they have as well, especially for bigger member states, a subnational IPC task forces, but also in uh, the different healthcare facilities that they have an IPC committee, or at least for the small healthcare facility to have one IPC focal point who will be in charge of um, implementing uh, IPC uh, measures in uh, the facilities. So routinely, uh, we were able also to support member states in the, the, the process of cascading down the training to reach uh, the different districts and healthcare facilities. But of course, in terms of uh, human resources and the training, the gap is still huge. There are millions of health workers who need to be trained and only thousands uh, of them were really uh, trained. Also, we are supporting uh, some member states to uh, improve their triage and isolation capacity at healthcare facility level, and uh, also implementing um, standard as well as transmission-based precaution through uh, the, the five step of implementation, uh, assessment, implementation, reassessment, um, et cetera. Also, um, maybe the last point that I'm going to discuss for this um, uh, first topic is uh, we also uh, supporting member states to put in place a strategy that will allow uh, to protect better uh, the healthcare workers by preventing uh, the disease and ident early identification of those who uh, uh, were infected, but also to manage better uh, those who uh, were infected. So uh, from WHO perspective, I'm going to share with you some key elements that uh, allow a better protection uh, of health workers um, against uh, COVID-19 but also of, of um, taking care of those one who are infected. So the first one, and it's a key, is to have an IPC program at uh, national, but as well as at uh, facility level. And if you can see in, in the African region, this is a big gap. Many countries did, do not really have IPC program. And I think that we really need to focus on this WHO as well as um, other partners, technical partners, as well as financial partners, because without uh, a sustainable program, it's really difficult to uh, fight against uh, infectious diseases, AMR, healthcare associated infections, as well as um, infectious disease outbreak. Another key element is to have an occupational health and safety program. This as well is really lacking in many of our countries. Uh, I think we, we need to have some kind of um, program with a focal point, with overseeing the implementation of uh, OHS program in each country. This can improve the safety of uh, health workers. Also during this pandemic, we are trying to see, support member states uh, to um, have a program of early detection of uh, COVID-19 in health workers so as to prevent further transmission. This can be either through syndromic uh, surveillance um, according to, to, to the risk uh, of transmission uh, in the community, but also it can be through um, a testing strategy which can detect as well some asymptomatic cases and uh, help to break the, the chain of transmission of the disease. 
Also, we are trying to guide member states on how to uh, manage better health workers who have been exposed, exposed but those who have been um, infected and uh, to guide them on the safe return uh, uh, to work. There are also some studies that have been conducted in the different countries in the region that can help to really understand the risk factors of uh, health worker infections, but also uh, the clinical features of these infections. And this can help us to, to fight uh, this, uh, this pandemic better in the coming future. And then lastly, uh, there are really some challenges that I think if we can concentrate it on, we can really improve the health, not only of uh, uh, the health workers, but as well to decrease the transmission of the different infectious diseases in the healthcare facilities. And the first one, the first challenge is as uh, uh, Dr. Friedman said, the lack of um, um, uh, IPC program uh, in um, our national health system. This is really a key. And for the next coming years, uh, WHO uh, Africa will be really focusing when it comes to IPC to support member states to implement IPC programs uh, according to the WHO uh, co components for IPC program at national and facility level. There is a, a project that we've started with US CDC to support six member states for the implementation of all the strengthening of their IPC program according to WHO guidelines. There is a lack also of institutionalization, leadership and weak legal framework. And I think Africa CDC is doing a, a great job uh, to develop and to have a legal fr framework for IPC uh, that will be uh, approved through uh, the African Union. And this is a very, very important for the future. Many member states do not have any IPC activity uh, planning. All the activity planning is not really um, focusing on the, 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 the priorities or these activity planning are not funded um, adequately. There is a lack of human resources, of trained and qualified human resources. And I think that uh, ICANN is doing a great job to really um, um, training, uh, provided training and education uh, on IPC of uh, health personnel in the region. And I think that this need to be scaled up and uh, to really target uh, the main um, uh, people in the different countries that need to be uh, trained first and who can then uh, cascade the, the, the training or the education. So this is as well a big priority. As I said, finance is an issue. Sometimes there are partners who are uh, financing some IPC activities, but this is limited in time and space and does not allow uh, sustainability. So each member state really needs to consider IPC when they are they are developing the annual budget. Also in some member states, we can see that there is some interference or of, um, so we can see um, activities of IPC are under many different directorates and it's sometimes really difficult to uh, put everything together in a harmonized manner. Data management is an issue. I think that we really need to have some kind of observatory for IPC indicators in the region that can guide partners, member states on where are the priority in terms of IPC and where um, are the priority to invest in, in IPC. The global portal, I think, for the WHO global portal, I think it's, um, it's good, but we need to make sure that uh, the, the region is really uh, submitting, but also that other partners are willing to, to um, consider data from the WHO Global Portal. 
IPC global portal uh, when implementing the activities. Guidelines are not followed by some member states and some best practice are not really implemented. And there is no plan for protection of health personnel, but we are trying our best to uh, support member states to develop these different plans. Some have developed the plans and have started uh, the implementation of their plans. During COVID, but let's say even beyond COVID, there is a need to have a strong microbiology uh, laboratories system uh, to uh, fight against uh, AMR, healthcare associated infections, and also to make sure that the strategies that are being put in place uh, meet the local epidemiologic situation. Global strategies of PPE is an issue as well, especially uh, during this uh, COVID-19 pandemic. And this can be one of the reasons why uh, health workers are getting infected in the region. More than 100,000 health workers have been infected in, in Africa. Also in some countries and region, we can see that there is um, limited access to water and soap, but also there is an issue with IPC infrastructure, waste management, wash infrastructure, and etc. So member states really need to invest as well uh, in the IPC infrastructure, waste infrastructure uh, to improve IPC in the healthcare facilities and to decrease uh, transmission of infectious diseases in healthcare facilities. So I, I think that um, at the continental level, uh, the different organization really need uh, to work together, maybe through uh, a kind of uh, IPC steering committee to make sure that uh, uh, there is no duplication of activities, but also that the main, the priority activities are being uh, considered. Thank you so much. Wonderful. <clears throat> Wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Cabego, uh, for laying out the issues and challenges of some of the WHO responses so clearly and succinctly. I would like to now move to Dr. Uh, Jean Schneller. Dr. Schneller uh, received his PhD in sociology from New York University. He has held faculty and research scholar positions at Duke University, Union College in New York, University of Colorado, and Columbia University's Con Conservation for Human Resources, and was a visiting scholar at Imperial College London. For the last decade, he has scrutinized healthcare supply chains and innovations in the US and other countries. He's worked with systems in training clinicians and others to make a difference in how supply chains are developed and managed. He was principal investigator for the Department of Defense efforts to integrate medical supply chains across the DOD services. He has a special interest in supply chain management in low and middle income countries. And over the last year, he has worked as part of a high level consortia of healthcare systems in developing collaborative solutions to the supply shortages in the era of COVID-19. Over you, to you, Dr. Schneller. Good morning and thank you. Let me just start everything here and see if we can do that. Well, I'm trying to start my video. Let's go to share screen and see what the hell will work. Uh, can you see my screen now? Yes, very good, thank you. Great, okay. Uh, let, let me start out by uh, saying first, Dr. Frieden's comments and the, Dr. Laundry's are really very important. Um, I started my career following graduate school working at Montefiore Hospital in New York. And um, I recall that uh, when I went into the hospital through the basement, uh, the morgue was there, the cafeteria was there, interestingly but also supply chain was in the basement. And supply chain, I would argue with you, has been one of the most undervalued aspects of supply chain, of healthcare, and particularly of healthcare training. And even as we look at schools of public health, 
Uh, we look at healthcare management programs and others, the amount of training uh, for managing supply chain, both in normal times and in times of pandemic uh, have been not there in a very strong kind of way, uh, which has always led me to think that one of the weakest links uh, within the supply chain was leadership. And uh, I think we need to keep coming back to that. Uh, we have been doing a great deal of training uh, within uh, different countries in terms of increasing the human resources in supply chain. And as uh, Dr. Frieden pointed out that healthcare workers have been uh, really failed uh, during the pandemic. Uh, I would argue with you that the, the failure really has been in leadership uh, in not creating supply chain organizations that would have the level of preparedness that we've needed for an event that really is not a black swan event, but an event that uh, uh, we have to be able to anticipate. Uh, three comments always I find useful is to start talking about supply chain. And by the way, up until uh, COVID-19, I would go to cocktail parties and say, I study supply chains in healthcare and people's eyes would just glaze over. It wasn't a very good dinner conversation, but suddenly it's a great deal of interest. First, distant waters will not quench a fire nearby. So one of the really critical areas that everyone is thinking about across the, the world is, is how do you begin to prepare supply chains uh, for a, an event such as COVID-19 and one where various uh, avenues for bringing products to patients and products to healthcare workers has failed. And I'll try to talk about that. Uh, D-Day was a very big day for the world in terms of preserving freedom. Uh, but it would have been pretty bad if uh, somebody forgot the supplies, the tanks, and even unfortunately the bullets that were used. And so we need to think of it not just as uh, something that needs procurement, but it really needs management in ways that we haven't seen. And if, if healthcare workers are sick, having products there really is not uh, nearly enough for us to be able to do. Oops, I, I just skipped by, okay. Um, let me talk about a, uh, the relationship, I think, between supply chain and other strategies. And so much of what we heard are strategies that are important uh, by Dr. Landry to be able to uh, work with workers in a highly infectious environment. Uh, but again, if supply chain is seen as procurement, the products aren't going to be there in the ways we've thought about. And in many uh, low and middle income countries, uh, supply chain has been pushed off to NGOs and distributors, uh, as well as government. And I would suggest to you that uh, much of what happened is not that the supply chain failed, it did exactly what it was designed to do. It brought products in relatively small batches uh, and in ways that were relatively cost effective to healthcare organizations. But really what failed in many instances were the strategic national stockpiles, which were terribly managed. We have written extensively in the United States about the failure of the strategic national stockpile and it's really inability to function during COVID-19. Uh, some of it was because of choices were made about certain products, and they, but in addition, it wasn't managed very well. And much of what here in the States we were able to deliver to uh, Hospitals were outdated uh, products and products that failed. And that's very important. So it's not just being able to secure products, but it's able to manage that supply chain. And resilience and readiness have not been part of the mission of most healthcare delivery organizations. And that has to do not just with hospitals, but importantly, as I think Dr. Freeman pointed out with nursing homes and others, uh, the preparation and the resilience and readiness was not something built into the system. So we need to be able to think about that because the workers are in, in all of those instances are at the end of the supply chain. We've just finished doing some extensive research and uh, with large healthcare systems in the States. And it, we've asked them to tell us what were the top 20 um, products that were shortages. And I think it's interesting as you look at the uh, top 10 of those top 10, seven of the top 10 are PPEs. 
Um, strategies for being able to deal with that are interesting because we also ask them in what instances uh, was there substitutability of those products as you began to look uh, for ways to protect your workers and uh, were there pro other products that you could use. And what you can see is that for PPEs that the substitutability was limited. Here the CDC looked at many new masks and other products coming into the environment and found that they were unfit, that they didn't meet standards. So you couldn't move easily from one supplier to another. In terms of connectors for tubing, if you went from product A to product B, sometimes you weren't able to move because the connectors were different in the new products that you bought uh, aboard. And so that limitation is interesting and uh, how to move ahead and be able to do that. And at the end, I'm gonna suggest some ways that uh, the, the great creativity that's happened within the uh, country is interesting. Uh, in my own organization, we developed our own uh, COVID-19 test and the absence of nasal swabs were terribly problematic. Uh, we repurposed from going to uh, a swab-based uh, test, the one where we were saliva-based and we were able to take straws. Uh, by the way, McDonald's has a great supply chain for plastic straws. If you cut them, they're great for uh, collecting saliva for tests. And so it's an example of some of the kinds of innovation that came about, but you couldn't do that with all. And so how substitutable products are is something that needs to be considered, particularly from a strategic as well as a procurement perspective. Um, I don't wanna be over academic, but I just wanna remind everyone how supply chains generally have worked. And you see here two views of supply chains, uh, one for a pandemic, a second for emergencies. And if you look at the left side of both of those uh, schematics, what you see are factories delivering products of PPEs to manufacturers by suppliers. And in both of those, there's very little look upstream from what those factories, where they're getting their products. And yes, there's great interaction. And when we've gone into the pandemic in other countries, we've seen government take a strong interest in uh, the emergency uh, uh, applications of supply chain. Uh, one of the great failures here and elsewhere has also been appropriation. Uh, I, again, I think Dr. Fryden was right on spot. Much of that focused in the States and, and other Western countries on hospitals, not on nursing homes and others where the uh, pandemic was having its uh, major effect on supply chain workers. And so we need to rethink that very carefully. Uh, why did that happen? I, I think, first of all, we had very little understanding of what a long range disruption would look like. And by the way, I think we still don't know the right answer to this. And I would suggest to you that there are three different things that were uncertainties uh, when we started, and some of them remain uncertainties. First, the depth, and we didn't know just how deep uh, COVID-19 would go into uh, societies. And so we didn't know how much time there was to respond. And we were very lax at the beginning in thinking about supply chains. Uh, China cut off a lot of product going around the rest of the world. And uh, many of us thought we could respond quickly uh, by moving production to our own countries here in the United States, didn't happen that easily. Second, the whiff, how much of a response was necessary, how much product we would need and where it was. And finally, I think what we're still grappling with is the shape of the recovery, uh, what to do and when to stop doing it and how to provide guidelines. And by the way, changing guidelines around products as we learn about how those products perform in different situations, what we can substitute. We've already uh, thought, pointed out that uh, substitutability can be difficult, uh, but what to do in terms of even sharing products. And uh, one of the things that we've seen in terms of um, ventilators is sharing across states in the United States. We very quickly were able to move ventilators from uh, the, the, the Northwest to uh, New York where ventilators were needed as we saw the progress. So it's the shape of the recovery, but also knowing how to move products to where they are when they're needed. As, as we look at shortages going on, and not just in healthcare, really across the world, 
what we've learned is going back to very quickly, this schematic that I showed with factories on the left, really focused going much more uh, toward the upstream supply chain, looking at uh, suppliers, but also the supplier suppliers. And one of the things that we've begun to learn is a very, very small item can hold up production for a long period of time. And also that there are many kinds of products that are produced elsewhere in the world that really we don't have the resources to be able to shift locally. And by the way, I think many low and middle income countries uh, working collaboratively can do a lot to uh, begin to uh, ameliorate the situation. And perhaps we can talk about that uh, in the discussion. Uh, but the up, we've had very little data, not just what is in production and very little data in terms of what the inventories were for finished goods, but we've really not had good alert systems, a control tower to be able to look upstream. And I think one of the lasting, uh, hopefully, uh, lessons from COVID-19 is that we need a control tower, not that just looks at what we have and where it is and what allocation looks like, but is able to look upstream several months, if not multiple months into the future to be able to understand where the bottlenecks will be. And many of those bottlenecks as we're learning with pharmaceuticals, as we're learning with med medical devices are far upstream away from where we had anticipated them. So let me suggest that uh, what we found was the perfect storm here in the States as well as in Europe and other countries is that the supply chain uh, didn't fail. The design of it did exactly what it was supposed to do. Uh, we outsourced much of what we did to other countries, uh, engaging in global sourcing uh, for all products, not just healthcare products became very important. Uh, we didn't manage uh, the second and third tier suppliers in a way that made sense, or we really weren't. And, and there was a great push uh, among healthcare organizations globally to reduce the supplier base. And many of them went to sole sourcing or multiple sourcing and really didn't do their homework in terms of where those uh, were. In the United States, we failed to learn from Hurricane Maria in Puerto Rico. There were 72 manufacturers in Puerto Rico, the only place in the world making the blood bags used by the American Red Cross. And suddenly we had a crisis in the ability just to collect blood because we didn't have bags. And if we had substitutes, the connectors uh, for those didn't work very well for collecting blood. Important. Uh, the distributors and the group purchasing organizations, by the way, that B should be a G, you always find a typo when you're making a presentation. Uh, the group purchasing organizations failed to meet customer demand under great pressure to lower costs for their members and had just in time uh, delivery. And just in time meant that inventories were low and reducing the number of stock keeping units and sole sourcing maintained. And the system worked great until it didn't work. It was important. Uh, the strategic national stockpile here and other countries failed. Uh, here it was terribly underfunded. Uh, it had uh, a, a focus on diseases that were of low probability. Uh, but certainly not something that would be uh, uh, had the vector that we have seen with COVID-19 and important and outsourced. Uh, many of governments outsourced to uh, distributors around the globe uh, their management of their strategic national stockpiles and it didn't work very well. Uh, the other thing that we've seen in Western countries as a result of mergers and acquisitions is a large reduction in the number of beds the United States over several decades has gone from one and a half million beds to about 900,000. And suddenly when you need an inventory of um, beds for very, uh, very sick uh, patients, intensive care beds, they weren't there. Again, we've shown great um, uh, ability to shift and be able to do things remotely. Telemedicine was able to do that. Tremendous innovation within the system but we need to begin to think about how we bring that uh, risk that we've now outsourced to group purchasing organizations, distributors and sole sourcing in other kinds of ways. And so um, there's Eugene, been a dumb, yes. Apologies, um, just a, a, a minute or two more. Uh, I will so be that done one second. And yep. thank you. Thank so you. we've seen a huge domino effect and the government suppliers and intermediaries generally failed. 
And so what we really need is a global public domain that recognizes that supply chain is a key strategic uh, function and one where the CEO of an organization or a government official isn't the weakest link within our supply chain. And without it, in short, we're gonna miss how profoundly the processes and practices for improving the supply chain will work. Uh, we've suggested in our writing, and some of this is available, uh, published uh, uh, for the redesign of a system that has a control tower that focuses on detection, response, relief, humanitarian capabilities, reporting, and really managing the analytics about it. Uh, Tom Frieden published a great article in 2014, laying out what were needed to have a robust uh, public health system. Interestingly, these are the characteristics of what you need for a robust supply chain system. So thank you very much. Uh, you can see other uh, aspects of our work. Uh, there's some links to some of the publication that we've done and happy to hear your questions. Wonderful, thank you, Eugene, and apologies to speed up. Just want to make sure we get Anne-Marie in. Anne-Marie uh, Pettis is a nurse with over 30 years of experience as an infection preventionist. She has expertise in both acute and primary ambulatory healthcare. She is currently director of ambulatory infection prevention at the University of Rochester Medicine and Highland Hospital. And Anne-Marie is an APIC fellow, Association of um, prevention interventionists and is currently the president of APAC, um, the Association of Preve Professionals in Infection Prevention and Epidemiology. So over to Anne-Marie for comments uh, on what has been presented thus far. Welcome, Anne-Marie, you have the floor. Oh, thank you so much. Um, yeah, this has just been wonderful. And uh, what an amazing job Dr. Schneller just did in terms of expressing so many of the difficulties that uh, healthcare workers in general and infection preventionists specifically um, tried to deal with through all of this and are still dealing with it, as he pointed out. And, um, you know, early on, uh, the American Nurses Association did a huge survey of their members, and 79% of registered nurses reported feeling very unsafe during the pandemic, uh, primarily due to the PPE shortage that we've heard so much about. And um, what happened for us in infection prevention is, sadly, we had to recommend unproven practices that prior to COVID, we never would have dreamt uh, to make those recommendations. We never would have said that they were okay. And, um, you know, obviously things that we've talked about, like reusing N95 uh, respirators for up to a week uh, and then reprocessing them uh, by unproven methods, uh, all the shifting recommendations that were coming, and sometimes they were at odds with one another, whether they were from the Centers for Disease Control, the World Health Organization, uh, your state, and the states were, were variable uh, and often conflicting. So what happened with that, we found, was that our healthcare workers lost trust in the recommendations that we were making as IPs. So just a, a huge challenge um, that was faced by all. And then, as we heard, many lives were lost um, as a result. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And I think bringing up the issue of trust is, is really important here. And we know um, hearing more and more about the mental health challenges and burnout that health workers face and feeling protected and safe and cared for is fundamental to, to keeping our health workforce at the front line. So thank you for, for providing uh, that feedback. I'd like to open it up for questions now. We have a few more, or just one or two more minutes. We may go over by a couple of minutes. I wanted to first ask all of you, why do you feel that we continue to see this as an emergency response rather than something where we invest heavily? And Deborah von Finkernagel has asked, um, where does responsibility and advocacy of this fit um, with the ACT A accelerator? Um, so advocacy and responsibility. So over to any of you who would like to make a comment.
Uh, uh, this is Gene Schneller. I, I'm not sure within the uh, uh, environment that was just mentioned, but I, I would suggest to you that the separation of infection control and supply chain, both at the government <coughs> level and at the institutional level, has caused tremendous problems. Uh, one just needs to be able to work much more closely with supply chain professionals, by the way, many of whom are nurses and who really understand what those issues are and are able to communicate those uh, throughout the purchasing process and to senior managers to be able to do that. And I think unless you really grab ownership of that, if you're not able to carry out the comparative effectiveness research to look at different products, you're not gonna be able to get that to administration, which ultimately has the responsibility for those strategic decisions. Over. Yeah, maybe I can comment a little bit. I think uh, this is still uh, an emergency, especially uh, in the African region uh, because of many facts. First, we, we still do not have the full capacity uh, to respond in many countries in terms of uh, uh, case management, oxygen, and even IPC, but also uh, these uh, new variants are bringing some kind of different um, epidemiologic features that really need to be handled con con uh, continuously. Um, so I think that we, we really need to, to, to still take this uh, COVID-19 pandemic as a an emergency situation. Okay. Thank you, and apologies there. I was struggling to get the mute button unmuted. Um, Anne-Marie, I would like to switch, um, as someone has written in a question, if you could talk a bit more about the trust issue and the loss of trust. Sure, so um, yeah, I, I think that that, it's sort of like the, how do you get the genie back in the bottle? You know, we, we taught infection prevention for so many years about the different things that were safe and not safe. And then all of a sudden in the middle of the crisis, we're telling people the things that we had always told them before that they couldn't and shouldn't do. Now we're telling them that, gosh, we, we have to do these things for now. And even though people understand that at some level, um, when things continuously shift, I, I think then after a point, people start to say to themselves, my goodness, does anybody really know what they're talking about here? Mm -hmm. And um, so I think fear starts to take over. And um, you know, I think some of what we're dealing with is just human nature. And Dr. Julie Gerberding um, says it so well, you know, some of human nature is to deal with things, you know, you look at a crisis and then you end up with complacency and then you go back into crisis mode. And, and so I think it's hard to stay in crisis mode. And since we're heading into two years with this and you know four different waves just in the United States alone, um, I, I think it's been very hard to maintain trust. And so I think some of the problem has been messaging um, from our key uh, organizations like CDC and so forth, they've done the best that they could do um, given the circumstances. But I think moving forward, we really need help from professionals in terms of uh, how to better communicate some of these issues and challenges so that we don't uh, suffer as much of a loss of trust as, as what we've had. And I do think trying to reestablish that, that trust, at least as infection preventionists, um, is going to be the challenge as we move forward. And then that really comes back to another thing Dr. Schneller said about leadership and having leaders that can hold that trust um, during crisis. And uh, also what you said, this, this vicious cycle of crisis followed by complacency really rings true with how uh, Dr. Frieden spoke about um, our need to 
not necessarily see this as an as only an emergency response activity, but a health system investment for the long term that is needed. And as Dr. Schneller said, this this COVID was not a black swan. Many, many people had predicted and spoken like oracles that this would happen. And for many years, we knew that the supply chain, especially of gloves, was largely coming from one country in the world. I'd like to, and a thank you to the many, many people who've stayed on, although we're a few minutes over. I would like to ask Maureen Coy, our regional technical specialist for ICAP, Dr. Maureen, um, to give a few comments based on her perspectives from the field. Thank you, Maureen. Over to thank you. you. Yes, thank you very much, Susan. And I hope you can all hear me loud and clear. Yes, very well. Fantastic. And cognizant of the time, I will really spend a few minutes uh, to provide some reflections from the field. And as I do not, as an individual, have all the answers or have a perspective of all the views, I did reach out to health colleagues working and supporting the public health sector and the ministries of health across five countries in South, East, and West Africa to get their perspectives on the COVID response, primarily looking at what has worked, what did not work, and what could be done better in the COVID pandemic response. There are some common themes which I will highlight in brief, and what worked well primarily was highlighted as decisive leadership, uh, both political and technical leadership from the ministries of health. And this led to these countries establishing national task forces uh, that were able to institute and enforce immediate containment measures, both in the initial phase of the, of the pandemic and also during the surges. Um, and these measures were revised accordingly, depending on the degree of the surges that were there. Um, secondly, there was a rapid development of the COVID-19 management protocols and training materials among these countries with prompt training of the healthcare providers in clinical as well as home-based care. Uh, there was the establishment of call centers and we are glad that in South Sudan, ICAP is responsible for running the national call center for the COVID response. And these call centers in these countries have been instrumental in being able to consolidate information from um, the community and be able to address any misconceptions uh, which were really addressed by the healthcare providers manning these call centers. Um, the provision of regular briefings and information sharing has been quite instrumental to the general population to be able to provide a clear guidance on where the pandemic is at the various countries, as well as um, agree jointly on how to address uh, the COVID pandemic response, depending on the degree of the surge. What did not work well? A lot of these healthcare providers did attest to the fact that access to PPEs, particularly during the initial COVID response and during the COVID surges, was a key bottleneck, as has been described uh, from our speakers, including Professor Schneller. So access to treatment also has been described as a key, another key bottleneck, particularly for the management of the severe cases. And the access to treatment was described as um, in terms of structural barriers where there were limited ICU and hospital bed capacity in these countries, as well as treatment barriers, um, which really speak to the access to um, imagine treatment modalities, ventilators, both due to their cost and just availability in country. Now the vaccine coverage has been low in Africa and generally the access to vaccines has been delayed in the African continent with the COVAX initiative providing most of the initial vaccines in Africa. There is now a slow increase in the quantity and variety of COVID vaccines in the continent but many countries are yet to reach critical numbers immunized. 
we see that um, generally in Africa, there are very few countries that have um, 10 or more uh, people who have received full doses of the vaccine per 100 people in the countries. So what could be done better? So a number of healthcare providers have actually reached uh, consensus that given now the progress in vaccine initiatives in these countries, there is an emerging vaccine hesitancy. So when there is a need to understand why the communities are reluctant to take up the vaccines, and this will require the ministries of health to establish platforms where the community members will be able to freely express their concerns in taking up the vaccines. There is also an issue around beating the COVID pandemic burnout. This is both in sustaining the infection prevention and control measures, as well as addressing emerging mental health concerns among the healthcare providers, as well as in the general population that is subjected to a state of continuous confinement and loss of livelihood among others. There are mid and long-term strategies that need to be looked into. There is a need to plan on how the African continent will tackle the next pandemic as we work together to end this current pandemic. Critical is that we have observed the nationalistic approach to pandemic response globally. And this should be and must be an eye opener to the African leaders and to the healthcare providers and the citizens to, to build a strong health system in Africa that will respond efficiently and effectively to pandemics and improve the general health of the population. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you so much. And again, thank you to all of you for staying over time. I think we would definitely like to have a part B um, to this um, topic. There is so much and I feel um, there is that we've scratched the surface, but need to continue uh, to discuss this and really wrestle with a number of the issues that were brought up. Trust, leadership, breaking the crisis and complacency cycle, and developing long-term investments in health systems that will protect people as well as the health workforce. I would like to say thank you to everyone who participated and to our speakers for their time and preparation. And I will hand over to Fatima to explain the next grand round. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, everyone. Um, just to note that our next grand rounds um, will take place in November. Um, and just to note that it's going to happen at an, uh, a later time, um, instead of 9 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, it'll take place at 10 a.m. And the date is um, November 16th. Um, and the topic will be on current work and future priorities of the Global Oncology Program. Um, and this is a co-sponsored session with um, between ICAP and the Herbert Irving Comprehensive Cancer Center um, here at Columbia University. So um, please join us. Thank you so much for today's session and for your active engagement. Um, and as usual, the recording will be posted on the ICAP website. Um, and thank you all for your attention and stay safe. Great. Thank you. Bye-bye, everyone. Thank you.